Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For our guests here in-house, we would ask that courtesy that our, to see that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. And of course, those watching online are welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And we will, of course, post today's program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference as well. Leading our discussion today is John York. He is replacing Rachel Gressler, who, unbeknownst to her own plans, had her sixth child on Friday five weeks early, or she would be here hosting for us. Uh, she now has three boys and three girls, we understand, so it's all nice and even fighting at the household. <laughs> Our host in her place, John York, earned his PhD at the University of Virginia. He serves now as a policy analyst here in the B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. Before joining us here at Heritage, Dr. York worked at the Program for Constitutionalism and Democracy, also at the University of, Ger of Virginia as the Director of Public Relations and served as a teaching fellow for one year. Prior to his graduate school, he served in the Coast Guard as a deck watch officer aboard the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Mellon for three years. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Kenyon College and his master's as well at the University of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. York. John. Thank you. So. Thanks for the uh, kind applause. I know it's sort of like going to a Broadway play. You open up the playbill. It's, <laughs> it's not her, but it's me. I'll do my very best. OK. I want to start out by giving you a couple horror stories uh, of the sort of things that go essentially unpunished in the federal career civil service. Uh, these are examples all from the EPA, though if you were to dig down to any bureau or agency, I suspect you'd find about the same thing. I'll start with a relatively tame example. Uh, a public affairs specialist, GS-12, uh, from Atlanta. Now, GS-12, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's $65,000 to $80,000, roughly, uh, stole a video camera from work and attempted to pawn it. Now, she was in Atlanta. It, it's, only, it's only fair. Atlanta, $65,000 isn't going to get you very far, so you're going to want to try to top up if you can. She attempted to sell that video camera, was arrested, uh, convicted of a felony, and uh, anyone care to guess what her punishment was from the EPA. 30-day suspension, right back on the job after a month. Um, another EPA employee was arrested for felony marijuana possession after police discovered uh, a growing operation at her residence. Now, this was before weed was legal in DC. So uh, she was placed on seven months paid, paid leave uh, and retired in October 2014. Another EPA employee. Uh, Wait, did that first, per second person get drug counseling? <laughs> <laughs> on their seven months paid leave, maybe afterwards. You wouldn't want her to have to do anything whilst on leave. Okay. It would seem unfair in a way. Uh, <laughs> Another EPA employee was discovered to be a registered sex offender, something they didn't mention during their uh, interview for the job. Um, they were, however, discovered looking at child pornography on an EPA-issued computer. The employee was fired, uh, but reinstated after appeal, which uh, they agreed later to resign only after reaching a settlement with the agency for an undisclosed fee. Uh, certainly, cabinet secretaries and federal managers should not be free to hire and fire employees without just cause uh, or for political or personal reasons. After all, no one wants to go back to the spoil system. The problem, however, is that the additional protections and procedures meant to ensure a politically neutral expert civil service have made it nearly impossible to fire public sector employees uh, for any reason at all. This was not the intent of the early 20th century reformers who replaced the old spoil system with the modern merit system, but it has been one outcome. The cost of an essentially tenured civil service is nearly incalculable. On one hand, there is the monetary expense, but the greater cost is a dysfunctional federal bureaucracy. When it can take years to fire a poor performing employee and many months to hire a replacement, it's hard for federal managers to maintain a motivated and productive atmosphere at work. Uh, here with us to discuss this, I'll admit, somewhat depressing subject are the following. First up, we'll have uh, Bob Dietrich. Bob spent over 35 years 
dealing with human resources and resources management across agencies such as the U.S. Department of Labor, the Defense Contract Audit Agency, and the Interstate Commerce Commission. Bob also has a long history representing federal managers before arbitrators, the Merit Systems Protection Board, the Federal Labor Relations Authority, um, and uh, have I missed anything? Any other venues? No. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> we have two Bobs. It's going to be confusing, even perhaps for them, uh, but we'll, we'll muddle through somehow. Bob has shared his expertise through teaching, including his current post at Graduate School USA right here in D.C. Next is our second Bob, Bob Gilson. Mr. Gilson began his federal career at the U.S. Civil Service Commission. He has since held multiple positions in labor and employee relations, as well as managerial and agency advocacy within the Office of Personnel Management, Navy, Army, Treasury, and the National Transportation Safety Board. Bob has also served as the chief negotiator on many labor agreements and has represented U.S. agencies before the FLRA, the FSIP, the MSPB, and the EEOC. Now, just through that list, that gives you a, a taste of all the venues that employees have to appeal any sort of uh, adverse action. That's something we'll touch on. Mr. Gilson has also taught hundreds of courses on manager-employee relations and federal negotiations. He's also authored or co-authored nine books aimed at federal managers, and he writes about labor and employee relations issues for fedsmith.com, which is a great re resource if you haven't looked at that, fedsmith.com. Although Bob retired uh, from federal service in 2001, he continues to represent agencies and train federal managers now. And uh, Bill Valdez is our last uh, guest there at the end, but certainly not least. Uh, Bill also has decades of federal government experience, but instead of assisting and representing federal managers, Bill was a manager himself. Most of Bill's federal career was at the Department of Energy, where he held director level positions across multiple offices, including science, technology, uh, and energy efficiency. Prior to his federal career, Bill uh, was both a reporter and a senior project manager providing strategic planning, planning services to multinational corporations. Bill is also an adjunct lecturer at American University and the publisher of the Handbook for Federal Government Leadership and Administration. Please join me, uh, excuse me, please join me in welcoming our three panelists. Now, you might not believe it from the looks of them, but uh, we have 100 years of combined experience on this panel. Um, <laughs> no, that's, that's seriously depressing. Uh, 103 if you include me, but okay. <laughs> Stop laughing over there. Is it? Okay, so I'm going to start it with a few questions before we open it up to the floor. Um, Bill, this is a question for you, and of course we discussed outside, but just jump in um, if, if the rest of you have anything to add. What is the, pro it's probably, how many people have public sector work experience. It might not be a surprise to you for those of you who haven't worked in the public sector. Uh, it's shocking, I think, the number of steps it takes from identifying a bad apple to actually getting them out of the door. Could you give us a quick rundown of what that process looks like? Yeah, well, thank you for that, John. Um, uh, you also, you didn't mention that I'm also the president of the Senior Executives Association. Oh, I did not mention that. Which, I'm going to put that on Rachel. Yeah. Um, she's not here to defend herself, so I'm going to and we represent the interests of all the career senior executives in the federal government. And as a career senior executive, and I recognize a few of you out there who were former senior executives, uh, this is the question that you hate to have asked of you. You know, what does it take to remove an employee uh, from service? Um, it really depends, you know, on, uh, you know, your agency's culture and also um, the kind of advice that you get from the portions of the agency that are supposed to help you uh, during this process. Technically, it all starts with uh, Title V of the Civil Service Reform Act, uh, which has two provisions, Chapter 43 and Chapter 75, that enable you to go through procedures to remove uh, um, employees, whether for misconduct or for poor performance. Uh, the avenues that you would use to do that depend on, like I said, your agency's practice. Like, for example, some agencies believe that Chapter 73 do not allow you to remove employees for misconduct, I mean, for uh, poor performance, and that's absolutely incorrect. 
you know, you're able to use that under certain circumstances, and it's advantageous to be able to do that. Um, in either case, you know, uh, you have to give a notice of proposed action 30 days, you know, in advance and provide the employee a reasonable amount of time to respond unless the misconduct is so egregious uh, that you can get the performer out. And, you know, you, re you had a couple of horror stories there. Um, I was successful in removing uh, one uh, employee for under Title 73, Chapter 73, within 30 days. Uh, it was so egregious. Um, but then I had another employee uh, who uh, I started action on this employee in 19, I mean, 2008. And I just learned uh, that this employee had finally been removed from civil service uh, this past year, um, so 10 years. Uh, and it took multiple managers to finally complete it. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, you may find this shocking, but I don't think I've ever come across an employee who thought that the action for removal was justified, you know? Yeah. And uh, didn't fight it with every tool available to the at their disposal. And those tools include union grievances, EEOC complaints, IG complaints, whistleblowers allegations, the Chapter 43 processes, which include, you know, the appeals to the Merit Systems Protection Board and even court actions. Um, so uh, the avenues available to uh, employees to delay or deter an adverse action are numerous. Um, Merit Systems Protection Board actually has a uh, chart that shows, and I wish I'd brought it because it would have shocked you, all the various avenues of appeal that are available to uh, poor performers. Now, having said all that, uh, I would just note that I think the vast majority of federal employees are anxious to do their job, want to do their job, and we're really talking about a small subset. Mm -hmm. But it's that same thing as the, you know, one rotten apple, you know, spoils the whole uh, bin. And that's what happens, you know, it, it's exactly what John said you know, that you have a system that was designed to provide employee protections and due diligence and, you know, due process, but it's been turned into a system by some very, you know, very small number of employees who are, you know, using the system uh, to their own advantage and not in the public interest. Just a, a comment. Um, a lot of folks don't know that there are only three reasons you can fire a federal employee. <clears throat> And by the way, you can't fire a federal employee for shooting their supervisor. You can't mm -hmm. fire them from stealing something. Cannot be done. The three reasons are, <laughs> and, and I'm serious, the three reasons are, in, uh, in, in 1978, the Congress passed a, a law called the Civil Service Reform Act, which allowed you to fire a federal employee for failure to perform a critical element of their job at an acceptable level. That's the performance rule. In 1942, the Congress passed a law that you could fire a federal employee for treason. And by the way, that's the only thing for which they lose their retirement. In 1912 and ever since, uh, with the Lloyd LaFollette Act, the Congress said you can only fire a federal employee for such cause as promotes the efficiency of the service. Now, and that is, that is the law of the land today for federal employees. So what constitutes for such cause as promotes the efficiency of the service? I'm sure all of you have a very crystal clear idea of what that might be, uh, unless I'm mistaken. No interpretation, easy to do, yes? Uh, I think John used the term uh, just cause. Just cause only applies in the federal service to uh, disciplinary actions below a, a, a suspension or below that are taken to arbitration. Everything else is promotes the efficiency of the service. So a manager like Bill, um, he has to prove that whatever that employee did, promote uh, the removal for that or discipline for that, promotes the efficiency of the service. And so uh, that complicates the process. He also has to fo follow what the 
uh, Merit Systems Protection Board, a, an administrative body, has determined to be the Douglas, what they call the Douglas factors. Ten factors that every manager must consider uh, when deciding whether or not to remove a federal employee. And you can lose a case if you have not done what they call a Douglas analysis. There's also books written on filing charges against the, con the how to compose a charge against a federal employee that you're going to suspend or remove. Uh, it's a very complicated business. Um, the, the process is, is not only uh, set out by law, but interpreted by people like the Office of Personnel Management, the Merit Systems Protection Board, arbitrators, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and you'll like this. There is no requirement that they be consistent. And so there is case law out there, tons of it, in which EEOC has a standard that it applies, MSPB has a standard that it applies, arbitrators have another standard that they apply. And then, then uh, and, and that's, that gets you started on the complexity of the process. Um, my daughter, who's an a executive with a, with a credit union, she's a private sector person, whenever we get into a conversation about what I do, she said, have they made it any easier to get rid of problem people? Because when she went to the private sector, she found out that basically what they do is they pay them a few thousand dollars and they go away. And so, at, at worst. And uh, I'd kind of like to do the same thing. Yeah? I'd like to pick up on one thing Bill said. And uh, in my total career, I think the overwhelming vast majority of the civil servants that I met were very excellent employees. It's what I used to call my 95-5 rule. 95% of my problems came from 5% of my population. But it was that 5% that was so noisy that uh, it made it very arduous uh, on upon supervisors and managers. A statistic that sticks out in my mind is uh, the 2014 Merit Systems Protection Board um, annual report. The number of cases that came before the board for removal for unsatisfactory performance was 141. Now, when you divide that by the total number of civil servants in the United States government today, that number is so far to the right of the decimal point, it loses meaning. Um, that was not the intent back in 78 with the passage of uh, the Reform Act in Chapter 43. But if you were to take a Chapter 43 action today, from the day you start, to the day you get to the point of removing somebody is probably going to be somewhere between nine months of the year. Once that person has received the proposed notice of adverse action to remove for um, performance after they've gone through a 90-day PIP period, where 90 days comes from, I don't know because um, the access only an opportunity to improve. However, it's come down that 90 days is that uh, period to improve. Um, invariably, you get somebody who then invokes FEMLA, Family and Medical Leave Act. And they become Teflon for at least the next 12 weeks, and you cannot use that for any way, shape, or form in terms of the removal decision. So it just elongates this entire process. Is it doable? Yes, it's doable, but it's a very long-term process for any supervisor or manager to go through. And, and that is, serves as a huge disincentive to our supervisors and managers today who want to do the right thing and to remove this negative investment from the workplace, from the workplace. <laughs> um, I would also say in, in my experience in uh, recent years, the decisions coming out of the board are terribly, terribly mercurial terribly mercurial. Back in 2011, they passed a, a, a there was a decision uh, called Wobacke, W-O-E-B-A-C-K-E, -E, which said that every, under the Douglas factors that Bob mentioned, what is the consistency of, of the penalty? And prior to Wobacke, it was the consistency under that deciding official. Wobacke said no. What has been the consistency of the penalty applied by that agency from Bangor, Maine to Albuquerque, Anchorage to Miami, and everybody there in between? 
me, that is an absolutely ridiculous standard. You know, you're only as good as the weakest link in your supervisory chain. Um, and I think, you know, that's, I would love to see the board apply that to themselves in terms of uh, consistency. But uh, yes, as the number of cases you have cited, I can cite you a lot more, <laughs> starting with an air traffic, I mean, not an air, an air marshal who missed his international flight over in Europe because he was intoxicated in the arms of a prostitute, missed his flight. The air marshal service fired him, and the board reinstated him. The board reinstated him. Well, what could yeah. be the possible justification for reinstating such an employee? Um, in my reading of that case, it was the board second-guessed management and used their own judgment. Mm -hmm. The board second-guessed management and used and substituted their judgment for that of local. And, and so that international flight was in jeopardy, if you will, because right. that person was not on that flight right. as an air marshal. And there's many more I could go through, but uh, there's a host of reasons as to why a lot of supervisors and managers have become very disenchanted with the process. Bill, you may or may not be able to answer this question, but the uh, individual who you successfully removed in under 30 days, what was it? I'm, my curiosity is piqued. What, what, what could possibly just be bad enough to justify that? Uh, uh, he set up a separate law practice um, uh, using uh, clients that he was getting through his federal job. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, I think a lot of people have a sense that there's many venues through which uh, federal employees can ch can choose to appeal. Is it also true that they can do so sequentially in most cases, or do they have to pick a venue and stick with it? There, the, um, the, the three big appellate bodies are arbitration if an employee is represented by a union, the Merit Systems Protection Board, and EEOC. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to... Um, Arbitration versus MSPB, the employee's written grievance triggers the arbitration process. Their appeal triggers the MSPB process. Um, if they have an EEO complaint in process going on, um, that, that may preclude them from going to MSPB. But the important thing to understand is that MSPB and EEOC, and this is really amazing, if they disagree on the outcome of a case, the White House has to convene a literally, quote, special panel, unquote, to break that tie so the employees can, can get them. Where employees get extra um, avenues is if the employee claims they're a whistleblower. That's a separate system from, from an appeal system. Uh, if the employee... Um, claims, what's the other claim? Um, discrimination can be one, but the um, there's one more. It's whistleblowing and it's... Uh, um, Retaliation. Yeah, well... Ret uh, uh, prohibited personnel practice. Prohibited right? personnel practice. Um, also an unfair labor practice with oh, yeah. the Federal Labor Relations Authority oh, can right, come sure. in. If the, uh, if the employee claims that the reason the agency did it was because of his or her union activity. Right. Uh, they're precluded from filing an unfair labor practice and a grievance on the same subjects. However, FLRA, um, the Federal Labor Relations Authority, in a decision that I equate to, to rearranging the angels on the head of the pin, um, has made it very difficult for an agency to challenge an employee's ULP as being the same topic as their grievance. Mm -hmm. if, if there's a word difference, in them, they claim it's a different process. A different and so those are the kinds, and by the way, in each of those processes, frequently everybody in the hearing room, the employee's representative, uh, everybody except the employee if they fired them, the employee's representative, the government representative, and the hearer, the hearing officer, are on the clock. <laughs> well, they're working for the people, that makes sense. <laughs> It's, that, right? It yeah. is not uncommon yeah. to go into a proceeding where everybody in the room is a government employee. Crazy. But, you know, the, the real, I mean, not the real issue, but one of the big issues here is the shadow 
network or the shadow forums. Um, so let me give you a few examples. Um, I had the great pleasure of running the Department of Energy's EEO office uh, for a couple years. And I asked my staff to do an analysis of where all the EEO complaints were coming from and how they were being used. And what we found out from that was that they were very small subset of individuals were using the EEO process. There equal were, opportunity employment, just, yeah. They were filing, people were filing multiple complaints most of them were related to performance. You know, they had some kind of performance issue that they were dealing with, but then they would file an EEO complaint to try to mask that. Um, and uh, then management was caught in the uncomfortable position of having to defend its manager, right? So they would do a quick settlement uh, to get their manager out, out of the... Uh, complaint process, uh, and then the performance issue would go away as well because the, it became a radioactive, you know, subject. Um, same thing with IG complaints. Uh, I had a, uh, a staff member, you know, who I was trying to remove, or not remove, but discipline, put on a PIP and all the rest, and I next thing I knew... PIP, by the way, is a performance improvement plan. So I was getting a call from the IG's office saying that, you know, I had done something which I had not done, but uh, I knew for a fact that the complaint came from that specific employee and that they were just sending a signal across my bow, you know, that if I proceeded against them, they were going to continue to make my life miserable. That has such a pernicious effect on your ability as a manager, right? Uh, you really, really have to want to get rid of somebody <laughs> to, you know, face that kind of uh, uh, retaliation. And retaliation happens, you know, to managers who do try to manage effectively their workforce. So let's just keep going with that thread. How does this litigious this grind of a process to fire someone change how managers manage? Well, first of all, the, I've never, in my career, I never saw an action that was allowed to be proposed by a first-line supervisor. Wow. That's how complex it wow. is. Generally, the, there's two officials, a proposing official and a mm -hmm. deciding official. Proposing official is generally a level or two above the supervisor. Right? Um, that proposing official job is to put together is to, is to be the focal point for putting together a case. Right? Typically, that they're advised by a an employee and labor relations specialist from the HR department, and then in in a number of cases by an attorney from the general counsel's office, um, who don't always have the same agenda. But but let's get past that and let's say that they do have the same agenda. Um, the proposing official has got to give them a proposal letter which has to meet all of the statutory and regulatory obligations, technical obligations, of, of, um, um, of that proposal letter. Now, the, what's interesting is that there's a, then a deciding official. The deciding official is the one with, that used to have the principal burden in these cases. Um, the last MSPB has basically required all of the procedural requirements on a deciding official to be met by a proposing official in the proposal letter. Usually, what's the relationship between the proposing official and the deciding official? A level or two up in the organization yeah. is, yeah. is the way it generally is. Um, the, that creates its own kind of political problems, and not, not big P, but little p politics in the organization. Um, First off, executive management, and, and that's not a shot at, at the senior executives at all, but executive management um, does not want a noise level often, you know, and cases like this produce noise. Um, the, in, in any case, the, let's, let's take a look at the proposing official and deciding official. The Merit Systems Protection Board has, has created kind of a situation, uh, they haven't said these exact words, but it, it, this is what happens. The proposing an official and deciding official 
can't speak with each other about the matter. Even though they work in the same organization and they're you can separate. Say ex parte communication where sure. the deciding official is having an undue influence upon the proposing official, so therefore the action is tainted. Mm. Sure. And, and so that's, that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that it means less to the deciding official whether this individual gets disciplined, removed, suspended, fired, right. than it would be to the supervisor or proposing Because official. they're not dealing with them on a daily basis. That's or, right. Sure. Not my problem, your problem. Of course. Right? But now you're going to make it my problem because I have to make the decision. Right. Um, so, the, and again, the proposal has to meet all these technical requirements. The, the manager who's, who's the deciding official has to have a hearing if the employee wants one. Uh, has to accept a, a, a verbal response and a written response. Um, most managers are not used to conducting those kind of meetings. And so uh, usually the HR folks and, and, and or the attorneys have to prep them for all of that, to be careful what they say, sure. uh, because they're, they're all, they might be sitting there, they're not might, they're going to be sitting there with either a union representative who's or done attorney. this many a time, or an attorney yeah. that the employee has hired to represent them. They're just setting traps for an EEOC complaint or whatever it is. Well, if I were that attorney, I'd be looking for holes in the case when, at this time. In any case, the, the deciding official has to go through that process, and then they have a laundry list of issues that they must decide. In so, if the proposing official has gotten something wrong, the deciding official has only has two choices. They can attempt to correct that, the record, and you'll see that that's a problem in a minute. But the other thing they can do is send the case back to the proposing official and say, I need to have this done right. One that, of course, has time implications in it. Uh, the second issue is that the Congress has said that an employee is entitled to a specific notice. That has been interpreted by the MSPB and others to be every single thing that this could possibly mean has got to be in the letter. So you don't have to be logical. You don't have to be even smart. What you have to do, what you have to do is the, the, the notice you give that employee must include every possible interpretation of, of what he did, or else you're subject to perhaps being reversed before the board. And so the charge is an issue. The next issue is, is as we talked about, Douglas, which has, which, and I don't want to get into a long thing, but this has to do with things like What's the level of the employee? I have to consider what the level of the employee, what the offense was, who did it affect. A variety of those factors come into play. Um, was the employee discriminated against if they make that allegation? Uh, is the charge correct? Um, is, the, is the efficiency of the service promoted? And to just give you a little side story that you might appreciate, we don't use three charges in the federal sector. We don't use theft. We don't use assault. And we don't use... Um, uh, insubordination. We do not use those as charges. Because in each of those charges, you have to prove intent. And so what we charge people with is, for theft, instead of theft, we charge them for unauthorized possession of government property or unauthorized um, removal of government property. For insubordination, we charge them with um, failure to follow an instruction. Uh, and for assault, we charge them with striking a coworker. That's because if we use theft, we have a legal, like a criminal burden, to prove that, that the employee was on notice with all of the criminal law background that comes into that. Now, can theft have a definition different in use, using it in, in an administrative area than in a, um, a legal arena? Of course it can. But the MSPB has decided, oh, no, it can't. It's, you've got to meet the criminal definition of theft and, and assault. With regard to insubordination, I don't know where they got the idea that that had to be willful, right. but, but that's the state of the law right now. There are many, many, many such defined terms in MSPB case law where you have a different, you have a burden that's counterintuitive. And you read this and you say, oh, that's no big deal, until you've read the 54 cases that address making yeah, it difficult. Sure. One of the things Bob said, you know, in terms of what goes into the proposed notice and the decision letter, it just reminds me of the commercial for Ragu. It's in there. You know? <laughs> it's in there. 
But um, it, one of the things that have led us to where we are today, too, right. I think, is culturally, internally, uh, at one time, if you had a non-performer or a bad actor on your staff, you generally had a horn of plenty. You had many other people to go to, uh, right. workarounds. With, and since in the last 14, 15 years, with budget cuts, sequestrations, and everything else, that's no longer true. And one of the things I have always tried to say to managers when I have them in a seminar, um, in labor relations, we have a term called BATNA. What's your best alternative to the negotiated agreement? Well, what's your BATNA here to do nothing? You've got a negative investment who's causing you problems, and you've got a number of other direct reports who are watching you as to what are you going to do about this. Right. And it becomes a cancer in the organization to do nothing. And you take a lot of good people and start to bring them down mm -hmm. because you have done nothing and they have lost respect for that supervisor and the manager. So it, it, it behooves you, even though it's arduous, to get going and to get, you know, and to do it. So you know you're in trouble, by the way, when the employees put a sign up that says, he's not heavy, he's my colleague. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one reason maybe to run a, a leaner civil service is just what you say. It creates an incentive to actually deal with issues when they arise as opposed to rerouting work towards less problematic employees. Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're dealing with in the federal government right now is actually real questions about uh, the composition of the workforce. Um, it has nothing to do with, you know, uh, removing bad actors or anything like that. Uh, the size of the federal workforce right now is comparable to the size of the federal workforce that existed in 1960. Um, there were about 1.8 million federal employees in 1960. Uh, there are 2.1 million uh, today. The size of the federal budget, however, in 1960, in today's dollars, was around $800 million. You know what the size of the federal budget is right now, right? $4 trillion or whatever. Uh, actually, it's probably <laughs> bigger than that, you know, given what Congress just recently did. Um, so you have a comparable workforce managing a much bigger federal government. But what hasn't happened is that there hasn't been a change in the composition of the workforce or the ability of managers to be able to bring in the people that they need on an effective and efficient you know, basis. So that uh, you know, in 1960, the composition of the workforce was, or the federal workforce was largely clerical and blue collar, right? The composition of the work workforce today needs to be highly technical. You know, you need your cyber experts, your s and experts, your, you know, uh, your policy experts. But we still have a hiring system that gives us clerks and blue-collar workers. And who is defending that system are, you know, frankly, the unions who are vested in retaining that existing workforce because that's who their dues members are, okay? So, no, don't, okay. <laughs> don't go into the argument, you know, the trap of saying we need to reduce the size of the workforce. We need to change the composition of the workforce and be able to do that. That's a good distinction. Before we turn over to hiring, I mean, we're sort of segueing that now. I wanted to, um, to give Mr. Dietrich a chance to talk about suitability removals, talking about some specific solutions to the to the uh, difficulty of removing federal employees now, um, either of the Bobs on suit suitability removals and whether or not that can be uh, changed or amended. Everybody who comes into the federal government undergoes a background investigation, and it starts with what we call a NACI, a National Agency Check and Inquiry. That's the lowest level. Um, but suitability deals with uh, character and conduct. It has nothing to do with a person's knowledge, skills, and abilities, uh, and, and how well they can perform their job. It, it all goes to character and conduct. Um, when I left the Department of Labor in 2011, I was getting about four to five referrals a week of things that were coming back in the background investigation that needed a further look at as to uh, is this person suitable or not. 
Uh, there's eight criterion uh, under um, 5 U.S.C. 731 dealing with alcohol, drugs, honesty, financial responsibility, uh, domestic assault and battery, uh, things of this nature, as well as then some of the statutory debarments such as striking um, against the government. And, but um, only OPM can take a suitability action to remove somebody in partnership with the federal agency if there is a material and intentional falsification uh, in the hiring process where somebody was untruthful in answering questions on their uh, declaration of federal employment. Um, give me uh, an example. There's a Denise Doerr, D-O-E-R-R, -R, uh, versus OPM and OSHA. OSHA hired her to be an industrial uh, health specialist, a position in the public trust. And in, she had been previously arrested uh, for growing marijuana with the intent to sell. Um, the long story behind it, um, but uh, when the report came back that on the declaration of employment, have you ever been arrested or fired, uh, arrested or found guilty in any time in the last 10 years, she answered no, which is a clear cut intentional falsification. Would the hiring manager have made the same decision had they known this up front in a position of public trust? Uh, the, it went before the board where they fired her on the intentional falsification and also the, uh, her dishonest conduct where she had been convicted, which was antithetical to the mission of OSHA as a health specialist, health and safety specialist. The board reinstated her and found that her lack of candor or falsification was not serious. But they did sustain the charge on her uh, dishonest uh, criminal conduct, but still reinstated her. Then Chairman Neil McPhee wrote a rather stinging uh, minority report in that, and why labor did not take that to the court, I don't know. But there, um, again, going back to the board, um, I would set up an internal process very similar to what's in the DOD, mm. where you have someone who's being removed because of uh, cannot hold a security clearance or has revoked a security clearance to give them their due process through the central adjudication facility over there and not have these cases go to MSPB. Mm -hmm. And again, there are a number of uh, Peter Broida, who writes the Broida's Guide to Federal Civil Service Law and uh, Employee Relations. Uh, there's been cases on both sides, but the ones that I've, I've read, uh, most recently in 2011, the Aguzzi case, um, the board put this squarely into Chapter 752, mm -hmm. uh, which is the adverse action procedures, and not under what was established by the uh, Congress under uh, Chapter 731. And I don't think the Aguzzi case meets the legislative intent of what the Congress mm -hmm. intended. In the Aguzzi case, um, again, it was a uh, intentional material, <laughs> excuse me, falsification. They reinstated her. Now, we only have about 15 minutes to cover hiring, but. Uh, uh, let me do something real quick on this yeah. issue. Bob is talking about just mentioned security clearances. And I know we only have a few minutes, so I'll just say something very quickly. The security clearance revocation process is generally used in the Department of Defense, it could be used in any agency, where the agency determines that an employee is no longer able to hold a clearance. The, in that, the, the, the case law on that is a, is a Supreme Court decision, uh, Egan v. Navy, and Egan v. Navy covered a number of cases, one of which I was the representative on. My case was called Luther v. Gray v. Navy, and in that case what happened was the um, employee appealed to MSPB, and we told the MSPB, you do not have jurisdiction in this matter uh, because um, this national security matter. They, they said that they did. The case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court overturned them. MSPB since then has tried on at least four different occasions that I'm aware 
to get that decision reversed. In other words, to get into the agency's business on who should and shouldn't have a security clearance. What happens, and real quick, if my security clearance is removed, uh, I get to appeal to a body within the agency. All right? That body that it uses whatever rules and requirements are there and makes a call. All right? That is appealable to an adjudication, one final decision within the agency. And then there is no appeal to Merit Systems Protection Board, arbitration, EEOC, or anything else. You're done. Nothing would, not, I don't believe the government could be better served than to have that exact same kind of a system apply to the, to the removal of, of federal civil servants. In other words, take away from the people with no expertise mm -hmm. in the work the, the second guessing of, of management. In other words, the Department of Defense is the best judgment of who should work in the department, judge of who should work in the Department of Defense. Uh, MSPB often applies the same criteria to people who are in a 400-person agency, like the last one I worked for, NTSB, to a million-person agency uh, like DOD. They, and and blue-collar to white-collar, they, they don't make a distinction. And so I think the agency is the best one. I also think we have to trust somebody. And the appeals process is a process of higher-level people second-guessing lower-level people all the way along the line. If I'm a deciding official, I've made a decision for an agency. It goes to a hearing officer at MSPB who makes a decision that can be contrary to second-guesses mine. And then it goes to the full board who make a that may make a decision that second-guesses mine. That goes into a, the, the, D, the federal circuit who may make a decision that, that, that is contrary to mine, who goes to the Supreme Court. And so the question comes that I've never understood, it's a job. When I was with the Defense Contract Audit Agency, you could not work for us unless you had maintained eligibility for security clearance, period. Uh, and several people uh, during my tenure there, uh, we had to remove just for that very reason. Uh, two of them did a try to appeal to the Merit Systems Protection Board, and I thought in both cases, I was the first one called to testify the judge was going to give a bench decision because under Egan versus Navy, that person had no standing before the board, uh, but unfortunately was being misrepresented by the AFGE. Uh, but still, uh, we have a lot of positions outside of defense. We have a lot of positions in the uh, civilian world that are sensitive positions, non-critical sensitive. Everybody who worked for me in HR was in a sensitive position. We mm -hmm. have in, we ha have access to everyone's background and privileged information, and you've got to keep that very close hold. Um, so, you know, I, I, I agree with Bob, and I have talked about this on a number of occasions. I would set up an internal process to meet due process, very similar to the central adjudication uh, process over in the Pentagon in the Defense Department for cases just like this. No, I'm saying for all cases. Well, I don't well, care what the employee does. The department should be the last review that that employee gets. In I other would, words, if you, we have to have somebody make a decision. Right. That decision shouldn't be five levels above and outside the agency. So with our last 10 minutes, I'm going to ask a, one question on hiring, and I'll free-for-all fashion. So um, it's a large percentage of the federal workforce retiring or set to retire by the third, or I think will be eligible within this. It spiked up last month. Right. Yes. Um, and we're having a difficult time uh, attracting millennials to government work, uh, as you may know. What needs to change? Uh, the federal hiring process is, is terribly complex. Uh, for those agencies that have a delegation of examining authority by the Office of Personnel Management, and everything we do in HR and the federal government has to come from a delegation authority from the Office of Personnel Management. Um, first thing I would change is everyone who is going to work as a professional personnel specialist in the government, in my opinion, should have a, bachelor, a minimum of a bachelor's degree. We passed the Defense Acquisition Workforce Improvement Act in 94 for that very reason, dealing with contracting officers. Um, there is a, and that, I don't, somebody said, well, you're being snobbery. No, I think I'm being professional. 
Um, there's a degree of critical thinking that comes along with the college degree, and I would say that person should have a degree, one, in either human resources and or number two in business. The delegation of examining authority manual is 381 pages long. We spend more time in the hiring process trying to justify that we have not violated the merit principles as opposed to finding the best qualified person. The veterans, uh, the veterans Guide to Adjudicating Veterans Preference is over 100 pages long. Mm. And, and a person who's handling staffing needs to know this cold. Um, and again, we have too many people, in my opinion, that are in these positions who don't have that academic background. Um, concurrently, we had at one time called the Federal uh, Career Intern Program, where I could go onto the college campus and attend a career fair there, and within two or three days come back and generate a uh, competitive hiring register from those resumes and students we interviewed and make an offer of employment. And again, the board found that that process was violating uh, veterans' preference mm -hmm. because these jobs were not necessarily advertised in the USA Jobs Network. You're absolutely right. We do have a very aging workforce that is going to wash ashore into the retirement roles, and we don't have youth who are coming in behind because in many of these jobs, it takes maybe three, five years right. to get them up to an operational speed, both in terms of knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to change the paradigm on this. We've got to change to make it less, less complex. Uh, I was one of the very, very first federal agencies that contracted with Monster.com only because I was watching my daughter when she got out of college get her first job. Who were they? Turns out they were in my backyard up in Massachusetts. And I got to know Jocelyn Talbot, who was the vice president for Monster.com. And when she started looking at our vacancy announcements, 11, 12 pages long, and she <laughs> shook her head and she said, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. <clears throat> we need to streamline the process more. We need to have a better ability to get onto the college campuses at the undergraduate and graduate level to recruit people in all, all occupations and walks of life. We don't have that now. Mm -hmm. We don't have that now. Also, back in the time, 2009, 2010, uh, when the economy went sour, we announced a grade five receptionist position. We had over 500 applications. And that's also true somewhat today in many occupations. We need to have a rolling process. Cut it off at the first 50. And if you don't have qualified people <clears throat> in that first 50, then extend it to the next 50. Mm -hmm. But to go through 500 resumes um, and to have a subject matter expert from the agency working with you, taking them away from their line duties, right. that's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. Go ahead. Well, I mean, the system is broken, right? So let me read you something that Jeff Neal, who is was the former Chico <coughs> at a, a DHS, wrote recently. He said, let me be blunt. The federal hiring process is a disaster. If we tweak it, reform the assessment process a bit, automate it a bit more, and simplify it a little, we'll be putting lipstick on a pig. And that is absolutely correct. If you think about it, you know, the modern civil service was born in 1883, you know, with the Pendleton Act. And that established the general framework for civil service in the federal government. You alluded to the 1912, you know, act and, you know, but there's been this accretion over the years of uh, different regulations. Um, and then we came to the 1978 Civil Service Reform Act, 1978. Think about 1978. Who was born in 1978? About half the people in this room weren't even born in 1978. Internet wasn't around in 1978. At that time, we were dealing with the Soviet Union. We were dealing with communism, you know, the encroachment of communism. We were dealing with oil shortages. I mean, 
the, the world has changed, but the federal hiring system has not. And to make it worse, the federal hiring system has become even more ossified, even more conservative in how it treats you know, the hiring process. So, you know, when people talk about, you know, reforming, you know, the civil service, reforming the hiring office, you know, no, the answer is modernize it. You know, bring it up to 21st century standards. Allow the monster.coms, you know, to help the federal government. You know, what Bob didn't mention was that monster.com actually, for, you know, created USA Jobs. It you know, the backbone for OPM. Right. And then OPM said, no, no, we can do it better. <laughs> Look how well that worked. Um, you know, so we need to take a step back, think about what we re actually want uh, the federal workforce to look like, and then design a hiring system that is appropriate for that new workforce that we want. Let me do a link, a, a real quick link. First line supervisor in the federal service has an employee who's not performing. Let's say they have three or four or five, five things that are very important to, for them to get done. And they do two of them abysmally poorly. Huh? So could they be removed for failure to perform a critical element of their job at an acceptable level? Sure. It would take six months, a year, maybe, maybe longer to do that, but they could be done. The problem, though, is not just with the process, but what happens when they get removed? The supervisor is now in, in the process of a year to get a job filled, or six months, uh, to get the job filled. So, that, so their choice is, do I keep somebody around who does three of the five things okay, or do I go after them, and then if, even if I'm successful getting them out the door, do I then have to wait whatever period of time to get somebody in to do those, to do those five things? Therein lies the problem. So what you embark upon from outgoing employee to incoming employee, from when you start to look at are we going to solve the problem mm. until you get somebody new to take a look at, is, in, is, is a lengthy, complicated process which needs to change. I'm in favor, and, and one last thing, I'm in favor of what the French do. I, I enjoy traveling to France. My wife is French-Canadian. We've done her genealogy over there. The French require people to take a baccalaureate exam. And in that baccalaureate exam, they must choose what their career is going to be, 18, 19, 20 years of age. They get a degree in the field that they are choosing to work in. And so the company that hires them, or the government agency that hires them, is hiring somebody that's been through, that has a university degree, and probably an internship or two in a field related to their degree before they walk out the door at 21 or 22 years of age. We don't get that in the federal government. And you might say, well, it's unfair to have somebody have to pick what their career is going to be when they enter college. And my answer to that is, don't, but don't apply for a federal job. If what we want are the best people out there that, to do the job, do we want the very best people or don't we? Then let's require people to have a degree in the subject matter area, an internship or two somewhere. I don't think we let doctors practice unless they've been interns, um, not so dissimilar. Uh, that's what I'm suggesting, is that we, we change the game. And, and we require people to become somewhat associated with the work before they get hired. There's also one thing called the Dual Compensation Act, <clears throat> that you cannot double encumber a position. Um, and I kind of broke the mold uh, on that in DCAA as well as the Department of Labor. And I gave my boss, I told him in June, that I am most assuredly retiring at the end of December in 2010. I said, let's announce my job now. That way, if we don't like what we see the first time around, we have time to re-announce. And then we can bring my replacement on board 30, 45 days before I walk out the door 
and have a period of time of a smooth transition. It can be done. It can be done. You have funded work years in your agency budgets. You are never at 100% of full employment throughout that entire year. You have a lapse factor. That lapse factor equates to dollars. And the strategic positions within your organization, you can do what I just described using that lapse factor to fund these and to get people on board quicker in your strategic positions. But again, as Bob said, as Bill said, we've got to start anew and to bring the entire hiring process into the modern times. Well, we've run shortly, uh, a little bit over our time. We might have um, time for one question if possible. Go ahead. We do, we, do, we do have a program like that. We did have a program like that. It got taken away under the last administration. But uh, it's called the Student Career Education Program, where you could bring somebody in during their college year and to work in the, whatever they're chosen. And at the end of that period, there had to be a two-year period, uh, you could convert them then to a non-competitive career conditional appointment. There was nothing binding on the agency. There was nothing binding on the individual. But it did offer you that type of internship, which, candidly, we used extensively. And it was smart. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. If you want to speak with them privately, we could do that as well. Thanks. Thank you.